right. Union of the Unwanted International Edition. Ricky, What's take up? it away. Yes, it only makes sense somebody who actually wasn't born in the U.S. is hosting the show. But yeah, we're doing a international edition of the Union of the Unwanted. We want to get some of our friends from overseas to join us and, and not have to join us at, uh, you know, 1 a.m. or whenever it is that some of the past guests have joined us. So uh, thanks, everybody, for being with us. We have some people who are going to jump in and jump out. So, you know, bear with us. If, if you see some heads just pop up, it are just uh, friends of ours that are going to pop in and join the conversation when they can. But uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. If you guys want to give a, uh, maybe, because there's not many of us, we can actually do this today. You guys want to give just a little bit of a introduction to who you guys are and what you host? If uh, the Amish guys want to <laughs> do it first. Yeah, I'll say that. Thanks, Ricky. Uh, I'm Amish Phil from the Amish Inquisition, uh, based in the UK. And um, yeah, we've been covering the corona stuff in, in quite a lot of depth since March. Um, we tend to have like an hour long interview um, with lots of really wild and uh, interesting guests. And then the second half we do sort of more like what Mike does with OBDM. We go through the news and play funny sound effects and, and try and have a laugh and deconstruct what's going on and the messaging we get from the media and from the powers that be. So um, just very thankful to be here and, and thanks to, to Mike, Ricky and Charlie for setting all this up. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, it's a great show. We've been I've been on the show and hung out with the guys and I had uh, <laughs> one of those times where you feel guilty because you're having too much fun. You know, it's supposed <laughs> to be kind of like, I don't know, work related. But if you have not checked out the Amish Inquisition, put it in your rotation. You won't be disappointed. We should say that uh, Sam Tripoli wanted to be here, but he has horrendous diarrhea and just could not make it. Oof. That's true. <laughs> That's going to be trending on Twitter very soon. Yes. <laughs> Rich Willett is here. Introduce yourself, good good sir. Hello, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah perfect. Um, cheers for asking me as well, Charlie. It's fantastic. It's really lovely to be and meet everyone. Um, yep, my name is Richard Willett. I'm from the UK. I work with David Icke, Gareth, and um, Jamie quite a lot. Um, at, well, actually, pretty much every day. Um, I host the Glitch in the Code podcast, which I've had many, uh, many, Charlie on many times. Um, it's a conspiracy based podcast, but we also go into other things, but mostly it's conspiracy based podcast and, and to do with all of that sort of stuff. But as you know, you kind of get into it and you go off all over the place. Um, and I also host, host a show called What If with Gaz, which is more of a comedy stuff where we look at all the strange things that are going on at the moment, and we have an unended amount of material to laugh at the, the, the sheer backwardness of what's going on at the moment. So that's more of a comedy-based one. And I've been doing this for about 15 years, looking into this stuff. Uh, my background is I'm a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, so I make a lot of films for the iconic um, .com platform, which is the new platform with Gareth, Jamie and David Icke that they launched. Basically, it's a Netflix for this sort of content that, that, that us guys make. And, and it's a it's a business. So you can earn a living making this content. We have budgets to make stuff. So it's an actual industry um, outside the mainstream industry to make content. Um, so it's growing really, really fast. Um, I've got thousands of subscribers in the first year and a half. We launched it in November of two, uh, 2019 and um, it's growing massively so that's getting really big and the amount of, so it's we're trying to build an industry so we have yeah. we're able to do this and make a earn a living doing this as well so that's uh yeah it's where i spend most of my time working making all the video content there and the documentaries and the various series um and um yeah we're, we're working on series at the moment I'm working on a documentary at the moment called um war of the words which is about media social media censorship and um that's my current project so yeah guys thank you for for having me on yeah, and if you see Rich Will, it's a Lockdown 2020 Prime for Panic documentary that he put out during the lockdown. Fantastic. You can find that on iconic, I-C-K-O-N-I-C dot com. Um, check it out for sure. There's lots of great documentary films on there that uh, Rich and the crew have been putting together for a while now. Real, Very relevant, of course. Awesome. Noble, you want to you wanna jump in? Let us know uh, who you are. Yes. And what Indeed. Thank you all. Uh, it's it's a, a great honor and pleasure to be uh, joining all of the uh, interesting minds and different points of view here today. Um, Noble here from the sunny UK, Birmingham to be precise. Um, CFR Network is pretty much like everybody else's um, podcast of sorts, but a little bit of a twist where I like to delve into the uh, 
the music industry and uh, the adult entertainment industry as well. And also just try and humanize the individuals within such genres of uh, entertainment. Um, ultimately, here to ask as many questions as possible, um, to bring forth new ideas and new thoughts. Key thing is to uplift fallen humanity and uh, see how we can progress and move forward on this uh, wonderful plane that we're on at the moment. Cool. Love it. it Sam, you picked the wrong show to miss. <laughs> <laughs> you could get into that for sure. Well, I think he might, he might still, he said that because he you was going to try and join us. Yeah. He's going to, he might jump in. Yeah. Which isn't unlike Sam anyways, to just randomly be like on a bike and like, right. You just see his face and he's all over the place or whatnot. But uh, Christian, you want to jump in, let us know who you are and what you do, bud. Sure. Uh, yeah. Once again, guys, thank you so much for inviting me. Great honor to be among such, uh, I, I want to say woke individuals. Uh, it's really, you know, it's where I am at, um, in the South of Portugal, I don't have many friends, uh, that are into this kind of stuff that we'll be discussing. So it's great to be kind of, it feels like I'm kind of part of a community now. Um, I host the connecting minds podcast, which is fairly new since October. Uh, I, I invite a lot of different folks on there. So I've already had Charlie and Ricky on there. It's not only about conspiracies. It's actually more about, you know, psychedelics, our collective evolution, individual uh, awakening that can, you know, feed into our collective transformation, which I believe there are a lot of facets to this. Um, I got a lot of doctors coming on and plan to have more doctors coming on talking about you know, all the various chronic health problems we suffer from, from addiction to obesity to, uh, you know, neurodegenerative issues. So um, I'm hoping that as the podcast grows, I will have more analysts on. So while the idea is to attract a more mainstream audience and kind of crowbar into a lot of the stuff that I feel is actually some of the most important things we should be talking about. So that's kind of what I do. I mean, I'm, my on my day to day, I I do a lot of stuff around health. I've written one book on children's health and I plan to continue doing that. So I feel like, you know, that's kind of my thing is in helping to improve the health of 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 the world so that we can be stronger, more resilient individuals and see through the bullshit and be able to, you know, resist uh, rather than be, you know, uh, uh, eating out of the hand of big pharma, big government, and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that's me. Awesome. So I think uh, Alex just joined us. Alex, you want to let everybody know uh, a little bit of uh, who you are and what you do, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, thank you for having me and greetings to everybody. Um, so I'm a Croatian national living in Monaco for the last uh, 25 years. Uh, former and uh, possibly future hedge fund manager, commodities trader, uh, 30, 20, 20 to 30 some year analyst of the current monetary uh, system. Um, spent a long time pondering what went wrong, why it went wrong, how we can write it. And that's essentially um, perhaps one of my key interests in life, uh, being a hedge fund manager is a way to make a living because I don't really know how to do anything else. <laughs> and I also two books <laughs> and yeah, that's that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is going to be a fun discussion because it seems like whatever direction the U S goes, the rest of the world kind of goes in that direction soon afterwards. And it's, it's amazing. I remember during the height of the lockdown, I actually had a lot of listeners of the Ripple Effect podcast who were hitting me up from the UK and they're like, oh, what's going on here would never happen in the US because you guys have this revolutionary type of his, history and philosophy and and, you know, it, and it was amazing to me how I I believed almost the same thing that so many people would resist. And yet it looked like so many people I thought would would not just take the news for what they're saying or 
fall victim to the fear of and throw logic all out the window, but they did. And it, it's it's been a wild ride. But I think these shows are important because it, it does show that like what's going on here is similar to what's going on all over the world. We don't live in a world where where we're not all connected. And propaganda is is I mean the same propaganda is pushed everywhere at the same time. And um, so I'd love to kind of get everybody's feedback on what's going on in their neck of the woods, uh, you know, especially with after the election. I mean, the election has been kind of crazy. Surprisingly, after the election, all of a sudden in Massachusetts, where I live, uh, the curfew can be lifted now. Like all of a sudden coronavirus isn't a big deal anymore. Things just happen to be getting better now that we have a new president. And um, so and, and it seems like little by little, that's what the direction we're going to go. They're going to start kind of doing less cycles with the PCR test, do all these things. And Sam is with us. And and then eventually they're going to give all the, oh, I, mean, I guess all the glory is going to go to Joe Biden who fixed the problem, you know. So uh, obviously, as you guys know, I'm apolitical, but it, it's, I think, people who still don't see that there's much more going on and all these things are being used as political tools. It just, I almost feel like they're, you, if you don't see it by now, then you might be a lost cause. But uh, so any of you guys want to jump in and let us know what's going on in your neck of the woods and then kind of has has anything happened? Uh, has there been a ripple effect from like the U.S. election to your neck of the woods? Don't I be shy. Just the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to jump in. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny you mentioned then about UK listeners saying that um, they couldn't see the U.S. following suit. Um, we know our sort of policy has been governed by SAGE, which is the um, scientific advisory group for emergencies. It's like this group of eminent scientists who are deciding just how fascistic we're going to be this week. Um, and we get, they release their minutes when they do the meetings. And at the start of last year, they said in their meet, minutes, lockdown was not even entertained as a possibility. It was only when the Chinese showed us how to do it and then it was imported into Europe in Northern Italy. And we all saw those Twitter videos of Chinese man falling down dead in the street. And it was, it was only when they saw it, it was like a domino effect across Europe. And uh, I think that's why. And then all of a sudden I remember Boris Johnson coming under pressure. All the other European leaders were locking down and he was trying to hold out. And there was only really us in Sweden towards the end. But the, the pressure, the international pressure was so strong politically. They just, they, they felt like their hand had been forced. Well, the, people forget, like, everybody's getting their information from, like, the WHO or, or you know, and, and, like, these big organizations. They're international. So people are like, oh, how can it be a grand conspiracy? Or are all the countries in on it? I'm like, they're all getting their information from the same crooked idiots, you know? So it's like, Yeah everybody is kind of being tricked by the same people. Like that's not hard to believe, you know? So yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, I know Portugal, Christian, like are you guys just mandated a lockdown? I, I'm obviously being Portuguese. My parents watch, yeah. um, you know, the, the noticias there. And it's, uh, it, it's just, they're saying that now they're locking down. I mean, based on what evidence, have you seen any changes there or they just like America just decide with zero scientific evidence that they're just going to continue doing shit for no reason. Yeah, so we, we've kind of been, it's been a lockdown, you know, lockdown for about a week now, I think. And uh, just recently they said that the shops will be closed from 1 p.m. on the weekends here. And, you know, uh, I'm walking my dog on the beach today. It's a freaking ghost town. They've, board, uh, they've put like barriers so you can't go on the beach and kind of areas like that. So it's very quiet, no cars, um, obviously no tourists now, like even... Even in, like where I'm at, it's kind of very touristy uh, area. So around Christmas, you would have a few people. Obviously, the, the, the big tourist season is kind of between March and October, but there'd still be some tourists before. Now there's no tourists. And it's crazy. And like uh, the I have one Uber driver here, and he told me that some – I don't know is it the same journalist that you were talking about about when when I was on your podcast a couple of weeks ago, but he said that they found out that uh, nurses, doctors that work on the front lines here with COVID patients are getting 400 euro a day extra pay. So he was like, 
well, the, if you're getting 400 euro extra pay a day, are you going to shut your mouth and be, be, you know, do whatever you're told and kind of help the numbers uh, be what they want to be? But other than, other than that, I mean, like, I, I, I know someone that knows someone that works in the hospital here and they're saying they have, they're saying the hospital is full. But what, what is actually happening is they've designated a tiny little area for COVID patients and it's full. But if its capacity is 20 people, it's not going to be very difficult to fill it up, right? So a lot of kind of, you know, fudging everything. I think I told you before, there was a doctor up in the north of Portugal that he got the COVID vaccine and died uh, less than a week later. And this is not making its way into so onto social media. And now apparently the authorities are saying it's not completely known whether or not he actually died from the vaccine. So it's very speculative. So that's kind of it. Um, they, so they, they could only, the constitution allows only for two weeks of a lockdown here. So at the end of January, we expect another two weeks, two weeks to be announced. So that's kind of, that's kind of where we're at. Basically, they're, they're at the mercy of, they're at, because the, the, the reason the, the lockdowns and the restrictions were, were super kind of um, onerous is because, as you know, Ricky, uh, the Port Portuguese economy mm -hmm. is really fed by tourism. So they wanted to, to ma maintain the tourism to some extent during the summer and shortly after the summer. So I think they will do anything they're told in order to be able to open up the border so some 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 money comes into the economy in the, you know, in the next few months. Yeah. That's a huge part of it is the tourism in Portugal, especially the, the English. You guys uh, love going to Portugal, a lot of English uh, tourism in, in, in Portugal. But th the thing is Joe Rogan actually said this when he, uh, he interviewed uh, Tulsi Gabbard recently. And I mean, I'm glad that he's using his huge platform every once in a while for actually putting this information out there. But he was saying he went to Google and he was looking for that uh, story about that Florida doctor who passed away soon after he got the vaccine. And he's like, I went to Google. He's like, I put in the exact doctors, the, the name of the, the, the exact doctor, put in all the exact information and the story would not come up. And then he went to DuckDuckGo and there he finds a story. And it's like, duh, this is the same shit we've been freaking saying for nine months. Like that information is being suppressed and not to protect you. Like it's not this whole idea that it's like to stop violence. or protect. I mean, I just shared a story today, which I'm sure some of you guys saw in regards to Twitter, you know, just in court basically saying that they didn't take down child porn because it wasn't against their policy. What the fuck is going on here? Like what world do we live in? And, and who, like, who are they protecting? They're protecting, you know, uh, it just, it's madness. The people who still defend th th this stuff, it, it's obvious that information is being suppressed. And, and it's like that quote that you're hearing more and more about, you know, first they came for these people and I said nothing. Then they came for that, those people and I said, and then they came for me and there's nobody else to defend me. I mean, I think it's a world war two quote, but it's, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what's going on. Like right now it's, it's, you know, it's benefiting the people on the left for political reasons. But at some point, you know, some, you know, look what happened to Bernie. Like they screwed your, your own candidate. So they're okay with screwing anybody. It's not about left or right. I mean, if you get in the way of the plan, if you get in the way of the elite, it doesn't matter, you know, what your ideology is or who, what you stand for or any of those things. So uh, people have to be wary of that. I mean, I, it, it's really sickening how many people are defending the censorship and defending, you know, what's going on because, right now it helps their political team you know it, it's it's wild well you know on uh <clears throat> excuse me TikTok, they were censoring pro-gay lifestyles and people were going nuts about it obviously on the left but they don't realize that censorship started from the right to left conservative to liberal and it will eventually come back around marxism and all that stuff that's what happens i mean you can't get anybody to look at history anymore, right? I mean, it's like history will show you in communist countries, women, ethnic minorities, and and gays get, get marginalized. But they don't want to hear that. They just want to get rid of the people that they uh, don't like to hear, which is a lot of the truth. And they want to live in, in fantasy land. It's like nobody studies history anymore. Everything's about here and now. And so much of this is driven by 
very rich, the, the, the children of the rich. I mean, we've heard that from the Unabomber. And we've heard that from Malcolm X. You know, the, the rich liberal is very dangerous. It's kind of my opinion on Elster Crowley. Like, he's just a rich kid. And all of his friends got into these powerful positions. And he was able to spread this dumb fuck shit that he believed because it never got fucked out of him. Right? So he's able to go out and preach idealism. And all of his friends from school and all of his parents' friends were in powerful positions that allowed him to push this narrative to everybody. And then you see all these idiots in Hollywood uh, acting like this guy knew something. Right? So that's the same thing right now. You have people pushing Marxism. You have people pushing taxes and censorship because they never lived through any of it. Especially these 20 year olds. They don't remember like what gays used to have to go through. The censorship gays used to have to go through from the religious right. They don't hear any of it. They don't know anything and they don't want to look back because they don't ever have to deal it. Because what do rich kids tell you? You know, don't say mean things and violence is never the answer, right? That's what they always say. Why? Because their entire life they've been insulated from fucking words that hurt and violence. They were born in the best hospitals, went to gated communities, went to private schools, went to Ivy League schools, got cush jobs interning at the best places ever. All their friends, parents or their friends got hooked up and they got jobs, went to pro expensive restaurants and private clubs. They don't know anything. Real life has never fucked them. Okay. So things like words do hurt because they the only thing that can touch them is words and violence. So that's why they push so hard against it. And that's why we live in a world where literally words are worse than violence, right? So in, 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 uh, when we had the Roseanne, Rosie O'Donnell, um, not Rosie, the Roseanne Barr thing with the, uh, uh, uh plan of the apes joke about, uh, uh, what's her name from the Obama administration? Uh, I forget. Rice. Maxine Waters. What's that? Maxine. Was no, 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 it was, it was Rice. Uh, Valerie Jack or something like what it was it something like that. Um, you remember she said she looked like somebody from the Planet of the Apes. Valerie Jarrett. Yeah, Valerie Jarrett. And Bingo. everybody yeah. lost their skulls in the black community, right? Lost their skulls. But they, they never looked at this woman and the fact that she pushed for Obama to assassinate Muammar Gaddafi. Which, and she wanted him to do it quicker than he did, which led to open-air slave trades in Libya. And then if they would have looked at her father, her father was part of the Tuskegee uh, 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 experiments, where they allowed the black community to continue to have syphilis and not treat it. But nobody looks at that. Everything's about feelings right now and being manipulated, and that's where we are right now. Facts don't matter to fucking these people. And you're like, who's watching? And I'll shut up now. I'm going long. I know. But, but people talk about, you know, nobody's listening to the news. Nobody is. But what's happened now is these blue check marks are the new mainstream media. And that they take these fucking clips and they de they put it out to everybody. And everybody looks at it because they have a blue check mark. And that's kind of what we're up against. I say everybody block blue check marks so you don't know who they personally are. If you don't know if they're not your favorite comic or your favorite like athlete, block them because they are simply here to spread information. And that's my opinion. And I'll shut up and listen. Well, many, many of these quote unquote blue checkmark influencers, quote, quote unquote celebrities, stars, um, illuminaries, the majority don't even run their own accounts. They, they, these are, this is potentially even AI that are, are putting out these tweets and, and, and they're doing all these things on their behalf. So the plan for divide and conquer, as we know, it's it's been set for, for for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. It's just over these times, it's sophisticatedly changed and, and tweaked and, and changed to the point now we're in a COVID-1984 Orwellian dictatorship. And the various countries, i.e., as you alluded to at the start, Ricky, um, America seems to get the memo straight away. They get the movie script straight away. And then Europe thing, I don't know if it's a delay with the, with, the, with the emails or whatnot, but it slowly then starts to ripple across and say, oh, we've got the script now. This is the plan. But, but the issue is, us as the, the, the general populi, when did we get a, a, an opportunity to read through the script and accept this contract and be a part of said movie? Because I haven't. 
I'm not getting paid to be in this damn movie that we're currently living in there, living under, I should say. This is um, something I just want to pick up on what Noble and Sam just said, a combination of what you said about deleting history and algorithms. What these left woke don't understand is that Alan Turing was the guy that broke the Enigma code. And he was the guy that invented, obviously, the computer technology and the algorithm. He was gay. For breaking the Enigma code, they chemically castrated him and he killed himself. Now, this is what I'm trying to, as Sam just said, if you look into your history, this is what will happen, not chemically castrating probably, but that's, they will eat each other alive. Maybe, Sam. Yeah, maybe, possibly. But they, they will take someone, use their skills and their abilities, then fuck them over, excuse my language. And that's what is going to happen to this left woke who eat each other alive now on their little cult on Twitter because they've got no left, no right, no bad guy now. So they'll just go at each other. So what Sam and Noble were saying there is it's just funny that they're using algorithms and that to, to get rid of the guys that are like us who are talking sense. But actually, the guy who invented, invented the technology that you became the algorithm, he was the guy that was chemically castrated when he was used up, and then he killed himself. This is the mentality of what we're dealing with. And if people can look back in history and see how people are used up, eaten up and screwed up and spat out the back end, they wouldn't join in. You wouldn't have 20,000 troops guarding a bunch of satanic paedophiles in the White House because they would turn around and go, because when it's my turn, they're going to throw me under the bus, aren't they? And as Sam said, look into history because it's coming for you guys next. Not that they'll be watching this anyway. Well, it'll, it'll be Antifa is starting to wake up to this. They're, they're just starting to figure out that they're the brown shirts. And now they're starting to go, oh, oh, I I remember what happened to the brown shirts after they did their, after they their uh, usefulness was uh, was used up and they were um, no longer needed. They were slaughtered by the SS. Guess what's coming for you, Antifa? You're done. You, there's no need for you anymore. You've served your purpose. And now guess what's happening? They're turning on you. Don't act surprised. This is history, man. It's like you can't, you can, you can act like a, you know, you can act like a maniac and think that you're a revolutionary and, and LARP all around the country and do all this stuff all throughout the summer of 2020 and, and, you know, make believe with your buddies that you're starting a revolution. But if you don't understand what happens to people in this role, if you don't look at what has happened in the past, you'll be the last to know you'll be the you'll be loading up into boxcars getting resettled in the east thinking this i hope this train ride is short you know because this is what they do you're not special you've never been special you're a disposable tool that these people are using whether you be antifa or anybody else that's trying to stir up this and once you've stirred up the riot You've caused the problem. The regime change has come in, i.e. now we've got a Biden situation. What do they need you for? Mop the place? Maybe, if you're lucky. Otherwise, you're out of here. So this is one of these uh, situations where it, it benefits you to have a, a little bit of an understanding of history. I'm not saying you have to understand, you know, back in the 1300s or anything like that, you don't need to go that far. You just need to go two generations back and you'll see what happens in situations just like this. If you believe that the people in positions of power are going to take care of you, you're, you're in for a, a, a rude awakening. And people have to be really wary of the word of domestic terrorism. Yeah, maybe, maybe OKC, you can blame it on a domestic terrorist. You can blame a lot of things on domestic terrorists. But you know who else was called a domestic terrorist? Malcolm X, MLK. Those were domestic terrorists. So, yeah, it's fine. You know, people don't m mind these words being thrown away as long as they're labeling people they don't like. But like Sam said, and a lot of you guys said, I mean, look at history. You don't have to go that far back to, to realize that, well, Anybody who's against the establishment, regardless if you're on the left, if you're on the right, wh whatever your views are, you're going to be considered a, a domestic terrorist. So, uh, like I said, there's a huge issue with people only being OK with this shit when it's when it's 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 censoring and labeling people they don't like. But they don't see the big picture that eventually it will come back to, to bite them in the ass. And and don't worry about swearing, Richard. I was actually hoping one of you Brits would uh, eventually use the you know, cunt properly, because I love your use of it. <laughs> you know, real quick, like the word terrorist is very interesting because it all depends on who's saying it and which which angle it's coming from, right? Like, like, what do you think the British royals 
thought about the Americans when they were fighting back and they didn't want to be a colony anymore. Like, what would you what do you think they labeled them as? Terrorists, right? They were terrorists. It's the same thing, man. And it, and it's and it's like, what's that? My biggest thing right now, I just want to say is that, you know, you know, right now, <clears throat> I, I made no illusions what Trump was. I said he was a he was a, a you know, a crime boss. I made no illusions what Q was. I said the information had to be real for so many people to believe it. What it represented, I didn't know. And today, I say the same thing. I, I find it very interesting, all these black pill motherfuckers who are going off on uh, the Q people right now, like, you that they they thought Trump was safer. Well, you knew Trump was this, and you didn't do jack shit either. So I don't really understand what you feel they didn't do. I mean, nobody's watching the news. Nobody trusts the two parties anymore. Everybody's getting off social media. These are all what we've learned in the last four years, okay? Here's what's going on. We do not have a, a, a rule of law anymore. From the assassination of JFK to the two elections stolen, okay, we have seen nothing but just the break in the rules of the laws and the people who are there to enforce the law from law enforcement, the judges, to the military have not done it. What can we do at this point? What do you? What were these people supposed to do other than pull their energy and pull their money out, which they did in spades? So I don't know what the answer is, but this this real simple thing of all these black pill people shitting on these Q people while leaving these Biden fucking cheerleaders free to celebrate is just I have no clue what's going on. I, it just it blows my fucking mind because everybody was saying that Trump's a piece of shit. Yet they didn't do anything. Yet the like let's say Trump was real and Q was real. What were the Q people supposed to do different? I I don't know other than. What I believe is, and I'm going to shut up again, but what I believe you're supposed to do, which is look inward and fucking work on yourself. And where do you put your energy into? No more news, no more buying their products, none of that stuff. So that's kind of where I'm at on that. And if I'd love to hear anybody's comment because sometimes I just think I'm just, I'm mad as hell and I ain't going to take it anymore. You know, I'm like a crazy guy like that. But that's kind of my opinion, man. It's like, I get it that like, that you could say that Q pacified these people for the last month, but once the election's done and all the shit's going on, I don't know what we're supposed to what what these people are supposed to do, uh, and that's kind of my whole point. It's like I, the system, the people who are set to stop corruption are doing nothing to none of it, collecting checks, brown shirting this shit. So. I don't know what the answer is, but I just find it very interesting. All the black pill people are teeing off on the Q people like the black pill people did anything other than blog and tweet just like the Q people. And I'll stop yelling at you guys. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in? Alex, you want, you want to jump in? You got you got your some thoughts. Um, with us? Yeah, just relating to what Sam was, was saying just a minute ago about um, – about the rule of law being vacated. And that's, I think, an interesting one. Uh, it's something that I picked up on a few years ago because I can't remember the name now, but one of these CEOs of some corporation, well, one of these military industrial corporations basically gave away in a statement that he said, like, it was it was about the mass surveillance, right? And then if you follow the news about mass surveillance, you know, you, you had uh, William Binney saying that it's all nonsense because most of this data is never going to see light of day, that most of it just falls to the floor, that it's just too much data about too many people. And then this guy said like, no, it's, we, we've identified 7,000 people who matter, right? Everybody else doesn't matter. What he meant by those 7,000 people who matter, he's talking about attorneys, about judges, about military generals, about uh, defense lawyers, about uh, media editors, uh, journalists, and so forth. Uh, and so uh, when you have this mass surveillance apparatus and you can uh, pinpoint these 7,000 people who matter, 
then you can completely vacate the democratic process. And the good example was in July, this New Jersey judge, Esther Salas, was assigned the money laundering case against Deutsche Bank. And it, had, it some, somehow had to do with Jeffrey Epstein. It was related to Jeffrey Epstein case, right? Because supposedly a group of shareholders was complaining that their anti-money laundering uh, practices uh, were failing because the bank kept doing business with Jeffrey Epstein. And so four days after she was assigned the case, an assassin shows up at her house, kills her son and wounds her husband. So, you know, in that environment, you know, you can, you can pick up evidence about voter fraud. You can, you can get all kinds of evidence about anything. Where do you take it? You bring it to a court? and somebody sends an assassin to the judge's house and they don't even have to send the assassin. They can just give her a call and say, don't take this case or make sure you rule the way we like it or else we're gonna hurt you. And then your whole system of checks and balances essentially is, is, a, is a facade with no substance to it. And at that point, I think the whole, the whole country has been stolen from under the people. And, you know, like now I, I don't know. I just, I just, I just uh, listened to a podcast with podcast with Whitney Webb this morning, and apparently, the ne next presidential elections will be done with some kind of a Microsoft system, election guard, or something like that. Nationwide, all the votes are going to be counted through some <laughs> Bill Gates system. So good luck. Where are you going <laughs> to? You know what I mean. And so at this point, I don't know what the answer is. I know, however, okay, so you said you, you might think uh, the answer is a military coup to restore the Republic. But this whole, this whole deal runs, you know, like I go back to my professional deformation of, 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 of studying the monetary system. This whole system functions on the money that you pay to all these A dominion system. The every the, the political parties work on 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 you know the whole system works on money. So who controls the issuance of money controls the whole system, the whole country, the whole apparatus. And so the key is to uh, overhaul the monetary system and to get away and to get away from uh, the the the. the the, the central bank issued um, currency because that's what catalyzes the whole rotten system. Anyway, so that's all I had to say about that. Vanessa, thanks for being with us. I want to go to you. I don't want to, uh, if anybody have any thoughts, but I know Vanessa, Vanessa's kind of in, in Syria at the moment and her internet connection is actually, it looks pretty good so far, but uh, we don't know how long it's going to last. So I want to see if I can sneak in here uh, before we lose you. But uh, if you guys aren't familiar, Vanessa Healy is a legendary journalist, somebody that I'm sure most of us know who she is and, and have uh, run into her work before. But uh, it's something that I've heard you talk about on some recent interviews, and I think it, it is really important. A lot of people in America think that we just voted away hatred and bombs and wars because our new administration is going to be different, <laughs> even though every administration has the same war policy. Uh, do you want to get into some of that? What, what do you what do you see for the, the future of the country you live in now with a, a new administration? Oh, well, you know, since New Year's Eve, uh, um, I'm unmuted, right? Yeah. Since New Year's Eve, um, we've seen exactly what the Biden administration is going to bring. There have been an increase in uh, U.S. coalition, a.k.a. ISIS, uh, attacks on Syrian army positions and also an uptick in Israeli attacks. Uh, in fact, on the day of the inauguration, uh, Israel bombed Syria in multiple locations. Uh, one family, entire family, was wiped out in uh, Western Hama, which is to the northwest of where I am. 
uh, allegedly they claim they were targeting um, a research center. It's not even an Iranian research center. It's a research center. Um, but in fact, as usual, um, they targeted civilian um, homesteads and residential areas, as I said, killing an entire family of four and injuring tens of others. Um, today, in fact, there was another um, ISIS attack uh, on the road to Deir ez um, in the last few hours, in fact. Um, three soldiers were killed and around 10 were injured, as far as I know. The Syrian Arab Army Air Force and helicopters uh, provided cover for the convoy to then reach Deir ez safely. Um, but, you know, I, I, as I've said in recent uh, interviews, Trump, um, was the economic battering ram <laughs> for Syria. I mean, effectively, Trump brought in some of the most uh, sadistic sanctions in Syria's history under the pretext of the um, Caesar law, which, of course, was a, a fraudulent um, accusation thrown against the Syrian government, as the majority of the accusations are. Um, it was concocted by a Qatari commissioned report um, produced in the West, of course. The entire thing was stage managed. Um, and on, on the back of that, basically, Trump has, has driven Syria into economic uh, freefall, I mean, into disaster. And not only that, of course, under Trump, the oil fields were occupied. Uh, Delta Crescent Energy was set up to siphon out the oil in collaboration with the SDF, uh, the Kurdish separatists, another US proxy in the Northeast, occupying Syrian territory and stealing their resources. Uh, wheat and barley crops were burned uh, systematically throughout the summer and the autumn. Um, you know, and at the same time, effectively, American troops are building up again. This is true, folks. Since Biden was uh, made president, American troops are pouring into the northeast of Syria. You know, this isn't some kind of conspiracy theory. This isn't fake news. We've seen them. Um, and they're definitely building up. You also have to recognize that even under Trump, the military base, the illegal military base in Al-Tanif on the border with Iraq and Jordan um, was uh, reinforced. There have been military exercises that again have ramped up leading up to Biden's inauguration. Um, terrorist groups that are protected by the 25 kilometer exclusion zone around Al Tanif and that are being recruited and trained in the so called Al Rukban refugee camp, which, you know, America keeps clear of Syrian and Russian influence. Um, <clears throat> we know that they've been using uh, HIMARS. Uh, I can't remember the exact acronym, but they're basically um, mobile artillery units that can fire missiles with a range up to 300 kilometers. So that effectively puts Damascus pretty much in the range of the Al Tanif base and the terrorist groups that are embedded there. So I think, you know, from a civilian perspective, we're bracing for war. I can't put it any other way. You know, nobody expects Biden to be. Um, peace and roses. This is we're returning to the Obama Clinton Bush era. <laughs> Crazy as that sounds, I know it's a Democrat, but it doesn't make any difference in my opinion. The madman has handed over to the lunatics, and Syria is in the crosshairs. We've got Jamie Ike here, CEO of Iconic. I'm curious, Jamie, you get um, you guys usually have a pretty good uh, insight into these things. You're you're right in the middle of it, and I know you're filming quite a bit. How are you? How have you seen things transform in the last couple of in the last couple of weeks in the UK, just based on this new regime, the, the regime change operation that happened in the United States? How's it impacting yeah. you guys? Well, the media over here have been pathetic for the last well forever, but they've been very pathetic in covering the. Uh, anything to do with Trump. So it's almost like, I mean, Rich, Rich will vouch for this as well. It's almost like a New Year's Eve party style celebration that he's gone in the media here. It's very, very strange. You know, you've got British politicians tweeting out about how, how much it's, you know, it's been four years of turbulence and they can't wait to work with Biden. It's going to be different now. It's going to be brilliant. And it's just, it's pathetic really. And I don't think anyone's buying it here, to be honest. I don't think, I think you've got the kind of, a lot of people made a lot of noise when Trump was meant to have a state visit here. Um, 
in terms of protesting. But I think that was just a small minority, really. I think I think most people actually, in a sense, quite liked him. Um, because there was, so, I mean, I don't, I don't like Trump personally, but there's there's something about him in the sense of, you know, we're we're stood having conversations in pubs in England about him, and you're a, th- a couple of thousand miles away. It's like he's got something about him that makes you want to make, you know, that is at least interesting. Whereas Biden, as Vanessa just said, you know exactly what you're going to get. You know he's going to go in. He was there under Obama when they went into Syria, went into Libya. You know you're just going to get exactly the same policy from him. He's a just a puppet, and the fact that he's you know, 78 years old, he's clearly, and clearly from any debate you've ever seen him in, he's got some kind of neurological issue going on there. He's not the full shebang. It's, um, he's probably just a complete puppet and Kamala Harris is probably one calling the shots or, or, or people behind her. So we were saying, um, interesting theory just to chuck out there that I wouldn't be shocked if um, Biden got taken out and they blamed it on a Trump Q type person as a justification to bring in even stronger domestic terrorism laws in the states because the fact that the guy's 78 they obviously hid him through most of the campaign didn't they from live television debates and interviews and so on so he could hide the fact that he's clearly got something not quite right but now he's president you can't hide him he's going to be in press conferences with world leaders he's going to be stood up at the un you can't hide him if he's got some kind of issue it's going to be shown very quickly so it wouldn't shock me if he was just like the puppet that's there to take the fall for then, you know, even stronger policies to be brought in to censor everything discussed on social media and other things in the States. That's just a theory. It's not an absolute, that's what I think is going to happen, but it's always good to say things before they happen, just in case you're right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We've seen the ramping up of the domestic terrorist tag. Um, It's this blanket blanket statement that that can apply to anybody that goes against the, uh, agreed it upon to us. It applies to all of us. Any of us who are saying anything yeah. against establishment. Yeah. That's what's so fucking scary is the fact that we could all be labeled as domestic terrorists. I mean, because we speak up against the government, because uh, the government's always right. I mean, it, what about during slavery? If we spoke up against the government, would we be terrorists then? I mean, like we talked about before, MLK, Malcolm X, these were considered terrorists. I mean, these words are so dangerous and people regurgitate them without even understanding what they mean and what they can mean for the future. Sorry, Charlie, I get worked up. <laughs> no, th- th- this this is the we have. Like you said, it's we have to be very careful with words. You know, you think, oh, well, there's just words. But the designation of these words, this domestic terrorist push, we saw, I mean, we saw the Patriot Act. We saw what happened in 9-11. They just dusted off the Patriot Act and put it on the on the president's desk. You know, it was pre-written. The, the, the idea that there aren't, there's not a, a, a legislation this thick on domestic terrorism sitting on some desk somewhere in some psychopath's office in the Pentagon, I, it, it just has to be. And, and we can see, we, you can almost... Because of what we do now, we're not we don't have a crystal ball, but we don't really need one. We we're pretty good at recognizing patterns. And we've seen these things happen over and over again, where it's like you get lured. Something happens, then they label that group and then legislation rolls out a little too quick for most people's uh, taste that immediately targets that group with some sort of, you know, rendition uh, i don't know a uh, censorship it starts with demonization obviously and then the next thing you know you just let the masses take over where where you're just the government doesn't have to do much of anything except just let the people try to shame you and we see this happening in social media and there's nobody left to defend themselves all these domestic terrorists that were on twitter are all gone <laughs> so now they're they're not in a position to say hang on a second i'm just criticizing the government i'm not out there with god i'm not starting a revolution i'm just saying that these people are cocksuckers but we don't even they're not even allowed to say that anymore because they don't exist. So it's a very dangerous time in America. And I, and I, would, I would assume that once the rest of the world gets a look at, at how we do it, they'll say, oh yeah, we want some of that too. Let's start going after the domestic terrorists in our country or in the EU in, in general. So it, it, it seems like a concept that's gonna get exported. I just feel um, oh, go ahead. real quick that I just feel like one, like they already do that with people. I mean free speech in some countries. I mean, look what's going on in Russia. That guy spoke up and now he's arrested. So, I mean, like this is what's coming to the United States is what you see uh, in a lot of the rest of the world. 
Um, but my whole opinion is, is that I am happy that we are all diversifying our platforms and how we get information out. I, I, you know, it's like iconic. I mean, like, look at that. I mean, the, putting out their own product. I think we should all do that. And so when, so that they can't silence all of us. And I'm just sorry. I mean, we have some one, all to, collectively, we have some amazing followers, people who love our content, man. But if you're only going to go to these couple places to get your information, you are as bad as the people causing the problems, man. If you are on YouTube and you know that they are silencing your favorite people and you won't just simply go to your address bar and put in a different address to go watch a video, then you are part of the problem, okay? Because we can't play there anymore. What we're saying, which is truth, and truth is scary now. We're living in a world where truth is scary, okay? Facts are now Jason Voorhees and Freddy Krueger, and everybody's trying to run from them. And that's really what's going on. And what's going on in the rest of the world? Like, I'm really in this place where it's like, you know, it's like, I know that we there's American troops in Syria right now, and I would do anything to stop it. I can't say they're my troops. I'm just, I'm a, I, like, I don't, I've done everything I can to, to do that. They're not my, this is the international banking cabal and they've they've taken U.S. military and turned it into stormtroopers, and I get as mad at them. I get as mad as Americans as I do at like is Israelis who are like, what say do they have in that in, in in what their government's doing? I mean, I'm sorry, man. It's just like they're they're getting bombarded with propaganda, and good luck on trying to stop anything that your government is doing. I mean, we have gotten to the place, and maybe this is how it's always been. But we do not have government that is respondent to the people. And that's, I, I don't, how do we fight that? That's the question. You know, I have so. an idea. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are doing this already, but especially guys like you, Sam, uh, you know, Ricky, you have a pretty big following. I don't know about the rest of you guys. I, you know, I'll definitely be checking out your podcasts. But if you have a following, I feel like it's our duty to just talk to your people and tell them, are you using DuckDuckGo? Are, are you mindlessly still just using Google because it's a habit? Are you using cookie auto delete in Mozilla Firefox? What are you using Google Chrome? Are you crazy? You know, if we don't tell people there's an, there's an alternative, um, you know, ad blocking software, you know, Pre preventing cookies from tracking you across websites you visit, uh, telling people, incentivizing people to go to your website to consume your content. So, I mean, I know some guys, they will put out an hour of the podcast. I think, Sam, maybe you do it. You put out an hour of the podcast and you tell folks, look, just come to the website, catch the, the other hour or whatever. Give them a freebie. Uh, there, there's a million ways to incentivize people to come to to the website because your website is like a hell of a lot harder to shut down than your YouTube channel, your Twitter account. So I, I even had an idea for, for, for a podcast episode is just to go over some rudimentary ways to protect your privacy. So like literally uh, installing DuckDuckGo on your phone for your searches and, you know, on all your browsers, switching to to an alternative to from Google, so, you know, Brave or Firefox. It's none of these things are perfect solutions, but if we can nudge some people down that path and then they can nudge someone else. Like, for example, I had my mom install Telegram today uh, or yesterday on her phone. So a little bit of an ordeal, but it's done, right? So if you can get five people to install Telegram and, and start chatting with them there instead of WhatsApp, that's that's a tangible, you know, something we're doing, right? So I think that's kind of my two cents there. Just to jump in, I, I totally agree with you, Christian, what you're saying there about using alternative software, alternative platforms. One of the major problems we have is that, the re you know, one of the reasons why Google is number one is because their stuff works and it's good and it's convenient for people. Same with YouTube, you know, it's, it's, it is the best operating video platform out there. 
and people will just go will, will always just take the path of least resistance and this is part of the problem we have and the, the second part is the problem we have is what we saw with parlor when amazon removed web hosting so literally we're all gonna we're all gonna have to end up with our own blooming server farms and just be little isolated islands of information because none of us are in, untouchable yeah so well, it's totally a shame agree. that sorry it's just a, sh a shame that, that, that jay just went because he could speak on that when we first launched iconic um it was me him and gaz and a, another lady that works in the office and um, gaz gareth Ike, um and we had all our stuff on vimeo and i said to the to gaz i was like um jay just get, get it off vimeo and get your own server built and luckily we did start building our own server pretty much straight away and lo and behold, David spoke about 5G possibly ever maybe being connected to Corona in some sort of way, possibly given the same same um, the same outcomes or the same same symptoms and on London Real. And not only did David get shut down from here, we got shut down. We paid for an, a, 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 um, a Vimeo account. We paid the whole year. We paid for everything. They took every one of our videos down. So our whole library, I think it was about nine months into building it. Luckily, we'd, we'd already backed it up and we were about to launch our own server a couple of weeks later. And that was an early version. And this was done about a year ago now. No, sorry, about last March. Yeah, so yeah, 10 months ago. And um, so this is what they will do. And, and this has been going on for a long time. Obviously, Dave has been shut off from every, every social media. I got chucked off of Twitter last week. I have no allegiance with Trump. Trump's is, to me is a Jesuit. Biden's a Jesuit. Bloody, does it, does it matter? In the UK, we have... We have Boris Johnson, who's a Zionist, and we have Keir Starmer showing him who's a Zionist. This is how it works. And I don't think people understand these things. But so I got chucked off for, for showing the video of the Trump supporters and the couple of Antifa being let in through the side door of the Capitol. And I got purged. And I've constantly been saying Trump is black nobility, possibly, and a Jesuit, and he's not going to do any of this stuff. And I still got chucked off. And I was like, that's quite amazing to me. Luckily, no one really listens to me anyway, so I didn't lose any people. But the fact is that that I got chucked off. I was like, how did I get chucked off? It's quite amazing. Because I was no I was blatantly talking against Trump for ages, saying that he's done all these things, he's given Israel everything they ever wanted. He's put a bloody embassy in Jerusalem. He's probably he's he's helping them build the Solomon's Temple on Temple Mount. I was saying all of these things where he's going with it. But I got chucked off. And as we were saying earlier, even if you happen to talk out against the, 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 the establishment, although you're not on the other side of it, you're getting stuck in the middle. And I think us guys are realizing now that, that what I've kind of realized is Twitter is a cult with Facebook. So you've got your left woke on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. You've got your right on Gab, your, your patriots and your few followers now on Gab, possibly Parler if it ever comes back. But then us guys in the middle going, they're both a bit shit. Where do we go? And that's that's where the truth is, unfortunately. Where do we go? And that's where we're getting censored and we're going to get pushed down. And I think that's right. We're all going to need to kind of diversify. It's a little bit like you can't stamp, stamp on all the ants if all the ants are all over the place in the garden. But if we all get together, then it's easier to grab them. And I think what Sam was saying, we need to kind of be over here and a bit over there and a bit over there and um, be organized chaos, possibly. Um, that's what I think the future is for us. We can all tell the same narrative, but we all kind of come together on something like this. But I'm on Library, I'm on Gab, I'm on Parler when it comes back, I'm on Iconic, which is a play for platform. It's a, it's a Netflix for this sort of content with the business built behind it. So we can, be, we can pay for content to be made and earn a living doing this. That's the future us, but having your own server is incredible incredibly important to keep your own stuff because as the gas has just popped up we lost all of our content overnight and it actually was nothing to do with iconic at all um Rich. but luckily we, we we had backed it up and we saw this coming and i rich. think other people haven't rich can you go into um as much detail as possible in regards to cost implications in regards to building your own server that would be where Jay comes in. He's the business brain behind it. I'm the, I'm the filmmaker and the video producer. Gaz might know more, a bit more than me about building your own server and how much it takes because he's in the office far more than I, I am. I'm stuck out at the seaside with no friends in my um, little outhouse sending <laughs> videos across. So, yeah. Gaz, do you, you got anything to bring on that? Uh, not really. Um, I'll be honest with you, Rich. I'm, I'm, I'm basically in the outhouse within the office. Um, 
where the sort of computer sort of techie guys kind of go, yeah, we'll tell him, yeah, yeah. It's like a it's like a tree. Off you go. Um, and kind of I just <laughs> yeah like that really. So I don't know in terms of cost. I'm not sure. I don't think it's cheap though. I don't think it's cheap at all. Um, well, saying then, that, guys, we've just moved into a new office, haven't you? And you've got a whole room, a huge room for the servers. So it ain't cheap, put it that way. No, it's it's strange. The size of it actually was a bit sort of beyond me, really. Um, but then it's also kind of to do with different. So with davidike.com, um, it's weird where things are hosted um, in terms of as much as people think the UK is free, it's really not at all. And obviously when this harms bill um, comes in, it will be out the window because who defines what harms, you know, <laughs> which is why it's sort of disconcertingly vague. Um, so obviously we're in a position where we're trying to host in various different places as well. So that if you get ripped down, then um, you've always got, you know, it's almost like you want to be like whack-a-mole basically. That's the plan. Well, well, uh, if you guys haven't checked it out, the Union of Dunwanted episode 14, we did a whole show with uh, people from Odyssey, Library, uh, Float, Content Safe, Rockfin, um, a bunch of people together, alternative platforms and whatnot. And then we gathered them to kind of talk about the future of technology. How do we fight this? How do we deal with it? Mike's actually are kind of tech guy in the Union of Dunwanted uh, out of the host. He, he's, uh, he might be able to kind of input some some info in regards to what something we we're talking about i think mike you are uh, you kind of got away in the middle of this conversation but it had to do with servers we we're kind of just discussing how hard and how expensive expensive it is to kind of do your own server thing and kind of get away from the having dependency on anybody else well it just really depends on what type of application you want to run if you want to buy your own physical server that's going to cost money in addition to the electricity and the cooling that you have to provide, the air conditioning. So how many servers are you going to buy to to service your infrastructure? Like today, I, I'm setting up my own cluster right now. I'm deploying my own cluster with its own servers, and I'm doing that through um, a service called Linode, or you can do it through DigitalOcean, uh, or you can do it through Amazon Web Services. But as we found out, Amazon Web Services, they don't really uh, like all content. <laughs> so... Um, having your own servers is probably the best way if you got the money and the ability to cool them and service them and hire on-premises technicians. Um, for longevity, you want to live in the cloud somewhere, probably uh, in the ocean, if you have servers in the ocean, or in some country that is not uh, too snoopy on or care about what you do or put out. So probably Russian servers. That's where Parler's going is Russia. It's like a digital version of hiding your money in the Cayman Islands, isn't it? You're going to just hide your tech in in somewhere offshore, yeah. So they I can't mean, get it. Yeah. So I, I believe Google actually has a, a, a floating servers. Um, so it's not unlike the uh, C, uh, like putting together your own liber libertarian anarchist colony out in the middle of international waters where there's no law but your own on the flotilla. You just put servers out there. The problem is running fiber out there. And, and making sure that it is able to communicate with the rest of the network. So um, decentralizing right now is probably the, the best way to go. And keeping your applications as mobile as possible, dockerizing them, using the latest and greatest open source technologies to ensure that your, your app can go up on the Internet quickly if it's ever taken down. And that's what I'm working on right now. So if, it, if I get taken off of DigitalOcean or uh, or GoDaddy doesn't matter. I got my app. I'll just throw it up on Linode or someplace else. Reroute my URL, and I'm back up in 12 hours. It sounds like pirate radio all over again. Exactly. It? Out in it is. Yeah. But the funny thing well, with that is. Though, is is obviously pirate radio was where all the talent was and where everyone was interested in listening to stuff, and so everyone tuned into pirate radio. And then in the end, they kind of half sold out most of them and moved to the BBC and places like that. I wonder if that's what will happen in the end. If this site like, alternative, you know, whether the mainstream will come cap in hand. Um, can we have some content, please? Well, the be, last resort. Be, I mean, the, the one the hurdle that is that is probably the most secure in the long run would be ham radio. You can you can send internet signals over ham radio signals that can be interpreted, and you can have your decentralized internet over ham. It's just that is a difficult it's, – it's the learning process to do that. 
is is fairly high. The bar is fairly high to learn that kind of stuff. But I think there's enough tutorials out there, and if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, I don't have a ham radio operator's license to hook in my internet and start serving web pages through a ham signal. Um, it's something I would like to do, but it's probably going to take me like three years to kind of build that and learn how to do it. By the way, who provides the you know, uh, licenses? Sorry, for for ham radio as well. I mean, who's providing that license? Well, there you go. That's the <laughs> <laughs> got to go to the uh, FCC or get your broadcast license uh, through whatever government organization that issues that. Yeah. Yeah. You so know, there's Proton a connection. Mail, there, Proton Mail are coming out with um, storage, encrypted storage. So maybe if if they get enough requests from users that we want like a, you know, a content distribution network for them to host. Maybe they would be willing to, you know, create the infrastructure where you can host your content there encrypted or maybe not even encrypted, whatever. And uh, just have a, a lightweight front end. Like it might even be hosted on GoDaddy or whatever. And you just serve the content from, from you know, distributed CDNs around the world. Yeah, and I think we have to take in consideration, too, that some of the justifications governments use to censor media are the same justifications they use in China and all these other places that we don't realize we're turning into. It, it It's always to protect you. It's because we're protecting you. It's because we're protecting you. And people are just like, yeah, it's because it's hate speech or it's because it's this type of speech or that type of speech. Like, like I always say, you fight, you know, bad ideas with good ideas you don't censor them you and even though I, I agree that like twitter is kind of becoming a left-wing echo chamber and parlor you can make the argument a, as a right-wing echo chamber but i'm much more okay with those echo chambers if they don't censor anybody if parlor stays true to not censoring anybody if they're not censoring the people from the left then i'm okay with that you know so uh, i think that's the other thing too is like i don't mind being somewhere where it's dominated by it's, one idea or another idea as long as none of them are being censored so that's that's a huge issue um, I, oh, sorry. I want to get back to Syria. sorry about this vanessa i wanted to ask you is you know at the beginning of um the election of donald trump there was a couple videos that came out that explained that a big part of what's going on in syria is that they found oil in qatar and they wanted to be able to get a pipeline. And the quickest way to get a pipeline, I think, to the Baltic Sea was through part of Syria. And that, but Syria didn't want that because their, their trade partners and allies with Russia. And that if that pipeline went through, then they would, that would be the oil and energy that goes to Europe. And Russia gives Europe 25% of its energy. And that would devastate Russia's economy uh is that what this is it oil is it or is this another thing to destabilize the area to try to bring in iran try to bring in russia for a world war three what are your thoughts on all that because here we go again what seemed to be like four <laughs> years ago yeah well i mean this has been ongoing uh, for 10 years of course and obama uh, actually pretty much started it with uh, clinton um, resources are a major part, but when you look at Syria geographically, uh, they had already previously destroyed, of course, um, Libya and Iraq. Uh, Jordan is effectively still a British colony. Uh, Lebanon now has been under attack economically for some time. And then with the Beirut blast last year, finally decimated their economy. Their economy now is actually in a worse shape than Syria's. Um, so Syria, if you like, was the last bastion of independent governance uh, in the region that hadn't yet been uh, targeted with the color revolution and the regime change um, project. We know, of course, from the Bush and Blair emails in 2001 and again in 2003 that were revealed in the um, Chilcot inquiry that uh, they had already been planning a different relationship with Syria if, if it came into line. And of course, the refusal, as you mentioned, of the Qatari uh, US-backed pipeline um, bringing uh, fuel into uh, Europe 
and Assad's refusal in favor of the Iranian uh, Russian uh, project, of course, was the final straw. But it also was because uh, Syria refused to relinquish uh, the Palestinian issue. Uh, it refused to demand that Hezbollah leave Syrian territory. Of course, Hezbollah grew out of uh, effectively the refugees from Palestine that fled and settled inside Syria, and then Hezbollah grew out of that. So there is no way on earth that Syria was going to demand that they leave. And of course, they have a long-standing alliance with Iran and with Russia. Russia has had a military base in Tartus on the coastal area of Syria for the last 50 years. So, you know, this is, this is not news to Syria. Plus, of course, it was developing the Five Seas project with China. So effectively, Syria was uh, the hub for all of uh, the, the global powers that were threatening a U.S. unipolarity, U.S. supremacy, and not only that, but Israeli security. This is the most important thing, because in my view, that for example, the recent Pompeo uh, utterances that you know war with Iran, Iran is protecting Al Qaeda, etc. This isn't really about Iran directly. What this is about is targeting Syria under the excuse, under the pretext of targeting Iran inside Syria, because what they want is dominance over Syria, which will give full security and full spectrum dominance to Israel in the region. It will isolate Iran because it will push Iran out of Syria, right? And it will cut the land route through the, through the Middle East from Iraq, for example, and down to Palestine. That's Israel's greatest fear here. They don't want Iran to have any sort of uh, further influence in Syria, i.e. land access to the border with the occupied Golan territories. Of course, Golan is also another aspect of this conflict. And of course, resources, in my view, is not only um, oil. Uh, Israel takes 30% of its water from the Golan, the occupied Golan. So water is another hugely important aspect of this war. Turkey, a NATO member state, has been cutting off water. In fact, I believe the drought in 2009, which was the precursor of this war, was engineered by Turkey because Turkey has control effectively over the northern, uh, the northern territory water supply in Syria. And we know that because in Hasekere, of course, Turkey has been regularly, and the SDF, have been cutting off uh, the Aluk power st uh, water station and depriving, I think it's around 1 million people in Haskar of water. So, you know, Syria is, is a, <laughs> it's a vast subject and it's very complex, but effectively America is not going to give up on this project, in my opinion. No way. How, how much does foreign policy in America immediately influence the UK and, and the propaganda you guys are seeing. I mean, it seems like it's almost par always parallel. I remember when we went to Iraq, it was like the <laughs> same stuff that they were selling us here. They're selling you the same stuff in the UK. I mean, does that always seems seem to be the case where it's just like they're basically the same po foreign policy? Well, I think, sorry, if I can just quickly say there, um, in my opinion, um, the UK is running the intelligence operations against Syria, for sure. Who and in the, the recent... The UK? Uh, did you say UK? Sorry? But I asked, did you say UK? Yeah. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because if you look at the recent UK Foreign Office document leak, both um, in relation to Lebanon and in relation to Syria, um, the UK has spent uh, millions on supporting uh, the armed groups, and those include Al-Qaeda, Jaish al-Islam, some of the most brutal and violent armed groups are operating inside Syria, of course, funded, equipped, etc., by the US coalition. But it's the British that, in my opinion, were behind the intelligence operations. That means the media, the publicity support for the armed groups, um, the, the whitewashing of crimes, the creation of the white helmets, for example, to act as humanitarian cover for the armed groups and also to produce the weapons of mass destruction 
uh, equivalent, the, the chemical weapon attacks inside Syria. Of course, that is now all unraveling real time with the recent OPCW scandals, the coming forward of experts that were part of the OPC, OPCW team, exposing the OPCW itself as a, as a compromised organization, heavily influenced, of course, by the UK, the US um, and Canada in particular, to retrospectively justify uh, the unlawful aggression led by the US, the UK and France after the Duma alleged chemical attacks in uh, April 2018. So the, the, if, you, if you look deep enough, the British intelligence have been uh, absolutely pivotal to this regime change war in Syria. And going back to 2009, Roland Dumas, the former French foreign minister, told us in 2013 that British uh, agents had effectively contacted him and said, look, you know, if Assad won't play ball, we're going to effectively finance armed groups inside Syria to overthrow the government. Uh, the CIA operation, Timber Sycamore. I, I, as I say, the, the evidence is, is glaringly obvious that this was an intelligence operation that was planned well in advance. There were various options. There were plan A and plan B. Uh, and obviously when Assad consistently refused to play ball with them. They went for plan A, which was regime change. But the British are, are, are you know, I don't think it's a case of um, the, the UK following the US. I would almost say the UK is driving policy in Syria. And, and that's been demonstrated on a number of occasions when, for example, Trump, I think the very first time that Trump was kind of talking about getting out of Syria, all of a sudden we had the Han Shehun chemical attack and all of a sudden everybody piled back on again. And that, of course, was orchestrated by the White Helmets that were um, originally set up by uh, British uh, military intelligence guy, James Lemaisurier, but also behind it were other uh, organizations that were being funded by the British uh, Foreign Office to produce these organizations that would infiltrate and produce the propaganda that would criminalize and demonize the Syrian government and its allies. So no, the, the UK is, is one of the driving forces behind this war. And so therefore, yeah, there will be parallels between US media and UK media, but that's because they're all operating under the same umbrella. I think that's really right. important to not acknowledge is that that they are all moving it's a one it's a, yeah. it's a one big corporation or, or movement or cult or whatever you want to say all moving mm -hmm. in the same direction i mean just an example is the house of windsor of the descendants of the merovingians and i mean prince charles is is um related bloodline related, related to donald trump donald trump's bloodline related to hillary clinton they've got it's like the 30 18th grandparents of Hillary Clinton are the same as Donald Trump. And people don't realise this in the world is that they are all related. They only get to that position because they have set various bloodline. This is a cult. And I think that's the real key to this is people understanding that all of these divides at that level are all just facades. And they don't realise that they are just working as one big unit. And anyone who's done an, any research into the, um, the conspiracies through the years will realise that Yes, if it happens over here, it's happened over there. They're moving as one big unit. And that's yeah. why it does seem like, oh, well, they were just following that. It's actually, it's all orchestrated decades, thousands of years down the line. But it really is quite easy to pick apart once you start to realise that the space, like the Black Nobility bloodlines, and you look into like the lights of the Jesuits, the Vatican, but especially the Black Nobility bloodlines, you realise this is a bloodline thing. This is a bloodline mentality. And so when you see things happening in the UK... That, that kind of follow what's happening in the US is because not because it's happening in the UK or the US it's because it's it's a cult movement within each country they then these people aren't only the only racism these people have is that you're the human race and these are a bloodline a lot that don't want you to have anything and they're psychopaths and I think that people don't understand that on the grand scale is that that there are a, us and them and it really is that simple is that whoever gets in these positions of power, because they've been established, they established those positions over thousands of years, that they are moving all this into one goal. And it is a satanic, weird cult that are, have got the most strange and weird beliefs that if you explain them to the to the uh, the average person who doesn't look into any of this stuff, it seems mental. 
but it is mental. And you can only explain insanity by sounding insane. So if I tell you that someone wants to go into the Middle East, into Jerusalem and build a new Solomon's temple and perhaps try and control the planet from there, is that insane? Of course it's bloody insane, but I'm not saying I want to do it. I'm saying that these people want to do it and they're all moving in that direction. And then all of these things come about. So when you see like a regime, like a Trump go out and a Biden come in, it makes no difference. They were all born from the same same mentality. Um, and they'll fight amongst each other, possibly. But really, at the end of the day, this plan, this long held plan over thousands of years is what is really important. And if you get in the way of that, even even Kennedy was was one of the families, the Kennedy, Onassis, they were part of the families. But if you didn't play ball, they'll take you out because it's the plan. And that's, I think, the real crucial thing here is that people don't realise that there is a plan an agenda that's thousands of years old and it has very little to do with what we see in the mainstream media and that's why none of it really makes any sense because you don't have the map for the terrain and to me the real hard bit here is get to people to understand that they don't care about borders don't care about countries they don't care about anything other than this one agenda and that's basically wipe a load of us out well, and control see- as many people as control as, as much as possible Branching off of that, of that, I have a question for Vanessa. I was wondering if you, since we have somebody here who is an expert in the Middle East, I was wondering if you could fill us in on the gaps or maybe let us know if there is a connection between this Beirut port explosion back in August and what that has to do with, you know, because if you see here in the US, FP, foreignpolicy.com, uh, they run a headline a couple of days ago that says Syria's hidden hand in Lebanon's port explosion. Now, <laughs> I don't believe anything that I, I read regarding stuff like that. I was wondering if you could maybe fill in the gaps and explain to us what, what was going on there. Mm. <laughs> well, first of all, that, that investigation was carried out by a guy called Martin Chulo for The Guardian. Now, Martin, I've written a couple of um, articles about him, but one in particular, in my opinion, this guy is very probably um, MI6. Um, He operated inside Syria with groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda when other journalists were being uh, kidnapped and tortured and beheaded, etc. So um, without going too much further into into his history, it's interesting, but I, I think he's very definitely connected to British intelligence. Um, added to which, um, just prior to this report coming out, interestingly, uh, Anonymous released uh, two uh, document dumps um, relating UK Foreign Office uh, activities, infiltrating Lebanese uh, high-level intelligence, security, army, police, and government officials. Now in the first dump, which I think was um, about one month before the second one, they actually warned uh, British intelligence officials uh, inside uh, Lebanon to to leave because the second dump would be naming people. And interestingly, the British ambassador resigned almost immediately on personal (laughs) reasons and left Lebanon as did a number of other operators who had also been instrumental in destabilizing Syria, funded by the British Foreign Office. So the the timing is interesting that this looks very much like a scramble um, by British intelligence to get back some sort of credibility knowing because Al-Akbar, one of the biggest Lebanese uh, media outlets is about to break the story of, of the second leak because they are investigating it um, connection, connecting Lebanese officials to British uh, organizations running this intelligence operation. So all of this they know is going on in the background, right? So they know that a huge amount of stuff is going to be revealed about British intelligence operations destabilizing Lebanon. So what they quickly want to do is to try, in my opinion, to throw the ball back at Assad, at Syria, just as Biden comes in to try and I mean, the story has fallen flat on its face. Nobody has actually picked it up because it, it's really shoddy journalism. I think it was Moon of Alabama looked into the company's house papers and they said, yeah, well, this company's been started up, uh, you know, a dozen times. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't connect anything to anything. So it's really shoddy journalism. 
And you look at who wrote it, you look at who published it, The Guardian, which has been instrumental um, in, in managing narratives uh, in Syria for 10 years. Um, <clears throat> and the Beirut blast, um, in the opinion of many analysts here, for example, and myself, I think was an attempt one, to, to finally, as I said, decimate Lebanese economy, because Lebanon, if you like, was the one stalwart, it was the one friendly neighboring country or, or powerful neighboring country um, that, was, that had a good relationship with Syria, albeit historically there had been divisions, there had been issues, etc. Most of them manufactured, of course, externally, but nevertheless, they existed. Um, and of course, it was the main exit route for Syrians. You know, for Syrians um, leaving Syria would go through Beirut. It was the safest exit. Um, and for journalists coming in, same thing. They would fly into Beirut and then get a taxi into Damascus. So combined with um, COVID and the lockdown and then the economic freefall in Lebanon and then finally the Beirut blast, which not only decimated, of course, the, the Lebanese economy, but many of the foodstuffs, et cetera, coming into Syria through Lebanon were coming into the Lebanese port. So this impacted onto Syria. And so um, I think all of this was about destabilizing, destabilizing uh, Lebanon, trying to turn the public against uh, Hezbollah. And of course, that's where, again, where the British Foreign Office intelligence operations come in, because clearly them trying to get influence within the security forces, the intelligence, the, the government officials, including the foreign minister, um, <clears throat> was to effectively um, provide uh, a counter against Hezbollah and to whip up um, popular opinion against Hezbollah, because of course, Hezbollah is not only the nemesis of Israel in the region, um, it's the nemesis of the entire US coalition as a result by default. I wanted to get back a little bit. I'm, I'm very glad to hear what Vanessa is saying because it, it has been my contention based on the research I've done for my, my book, Grand Deception, which, which, is, which concerns Russia, that when you dig deep enough, you find out that actually US foreign policy is UK foreign policy. Basically, the relationship appears to be the, the master blaster from, you know, Mad Max, where you have like the big strong guy, but there's an old decrepit tiny guy who's actually telling him where to whack, where to go, what to do. And so uh, same thing uh, um, a few years ago, we saw when, um, when there was a drone that went down, a uh, U.S. drone went down over uh, uh, close to the to the Iranian uh, territory, territory. The Iranians took it down, and then Trump said, uh, "We're not going to escalate." He didn't launch the bombing mission in Russia. Uh, shortly after that, uh, the anonymous which apparently is controlled by um, the FBI, according to WikiLeaks, and WikiLeaks hasn't been wrong yet. The anonymous leaked out the cables between the US uh, British embassy. The ambassador at the time was Sir Kim Darroch and London Foreign Office. And basically what came out of those cable was that the whole thing was being orchestrated by British intelligence that uh, they knew that mm, Donald Trump wasn't on board, but Sir Kim Derrick was saying, like, we can put people around him. He said, we can flood the zone around Trump, and we can, you know, like, when they manufacture an incident, they can pressure him into launching an attack on Iran. And that was another one, um, another example where it emerged that it's, the British intelligence that's running the agenda. And the agenda goes back to, I wouldn't agree with Richard, thousands of years, but it runs back to about 200 years. And it was already at that time that they, they the Mackinders formulated this thing where the, Brit, the British Empire had to rule over the uh, world island, over the, over the Eurasian 
continent. And because you can't do this militarily because it's the largest landmass on earth. It's like, uh, I don't know what, 60% of the global GDP and mo most of the population of the world. So you can't do it militarily. So you have to arrange it so that you can always pit power against power, right? You can always pit Pakistan versus India, Iran versus Iraq, uh, versus Saudi Arabia, Lebanon versus Israel, and so forth. So you always have these little uh, crisis spots and the only thing that has changed is that after 200 years of empire, Britain basically um, exhausted itself and then they moved their headquarters to the United States, established the Federal Reserve, and then used the American military muscle and American um, economic wealth to continue the same empire building scheme that is still going on today. And now that Donald Trump's no longer in power, so that attack on Iran uh, two years ago failed, now that Biden is in power, I think that we might see a renewed attempt to go against Iran, obviously trying to destabilize Russia, try to pit Ukraine versus Russia and so forth. So, so I, think, I think that we're in for a, for a bumpy ride here. Hey, Mike, can you let uh, Jamie Ike in? He's in, he's in the waiting room. Thank one, you. One thing I found very interesting is like how, you know, England is this, you know, they have the soup, their, their monetary unit is valued so high. Right. But it's like, what, what do they, how was their economy based on? Like they have no natural resources. There's nothing for them to export, you know, to, to help their economy grow. What is it exactly? And when you hear the master blaster uh you know reference that totally makes sense to me and i've always felt that like we were kind of the the big dumb muscle for you know the city well, of london yeah. likely right yeah well they're the mothership of the of the monetary system that they created with the bank of england and that monetary system basically uh is the is the is the parasite that can make the host do what the parasite wants, you know, like in nature. And so basically you have somebody controlling the issue of money in a certain economy. And once they control the issue of money, they can make sure that the right academic organization, that the right corporations, that the right uh, military uh, industry, you know, like that all the right people get the money and all the wrong people don't get money. And you even have a very recent statement by Mark Carney who basically came out and said it flat out and said like, well, we'll make sure that the people who are helpful to our agenda get the money and the people who are not don't get the money. And so once you don't get the money, then you're one of us here, you know, uh, uh, working hard to be heard by 12 people in the world, whereas they, you know, uh, go on the World Economic Forum and, and, and blast their message everywhere. But, you know, I'll tell you something that I hope you'll find encouraging because I grew up, I grew up in a communist system, right? And so I was a teenager in the mid to late 1980s. Uh, we had the communist party in power. The communist party controlled the central bank. They controlled all the media. They controlled the police. They controlled the military, the courts, the, the judges, the prosecutors. They controlled everything. But once the system started to implode under the weight of its own contradictions, Everything they tried to do, like ramping up, um, ramping up the propaganda, ramping up the censorship, um, they even like started putting uh, uh, um, phone numbers in the public transport to like, if you see some, you know, like if you see something, say something to get people to snitch on each other. Nothing helped. When it was ready to implode, it imploded. And so will this one. So uh, I think that a lot of what we're seeing is our, they, they control, they can't control billions of us. A lot of what we're seeing are attempt to intimidate us into being passive and into acquiescing and, and uh, using, you know, using these, these, these little tricks to make us think that they can control more than they actually can control because they need us to acquiesce and to uh, cooperate. And I don't think they're going to be successful. I think it's actually impossible for them to be successful. It's just going to be a question of time when the whole thing 
implodes and then what we can put in its place. And where did we see this on a on a smaller scale with the president of Belarus being told that he would be given all of this access to capital if he imposed the lockdowns and he said, I'm not doing it. And they upped it. We'll give you more. We'll give you more. We'll give you more. Uh, if that's not obvious to everybody that this is a planned operation, I don't know what is. If you have to, if you have to bribe somebody to get on board with this operation, it's an operation. Yeah. It's by, by def definition. So it, it and of course it, that information got totally squashed here in the in the United States where it was rarely available if ever it was on social media and then it was gone almost immediately but but for those of us that were paying attention we saw this we saw we saw a guy giving up the plan yeah, <laughs> he exactly. just straight up said it yeah yeah and it doesn't re and nobody reacts to that humongous story that came out and they just it's it's unbelievable. You know, when the whole Hunter Biden laptop came out, you know, the people in the truth community was like, dude, this guy's smoking crack and talking to China. And everyone's like, whatever, dude. And then as soon as like CNN starts saying it, they're like, can you believe he's smoking crack and talking to China? And you're like, I just told you this like a month ago. Why? Why does it come from them? The lying liars who lie. Do you take it from them and not your buddy that you've known for 20? I think even my brother who like, we look like twins. He, could, he wouldn't take a word I have to say. It's unbelievable. But it's like someone on TV, some shiny metrosexual robot says it, reading off a teleprompter. All of a sudden it's like, yeah, that's it. I just don't get, I don't get it, man. It's unbelievable to me. But, but 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 I but I think I think that things have changed significantly. You know, I think that the, that because I know that since this since this uh, the, the 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 fake pandemic started, I had a lot of friends who took me for like a loopy conspiracy theorist, and uh, I can tell you that a number of them came around and said like, "Dude, fuck, you were right. Oh, I can't believe it." And so you know, people who have uh, who woke up late are sometimes uh, the fieriest uh, opponents of what's going on because they feel betrayed they, they feel cheated and i have friends whose children had leukemia and then when they went back and looked at the inserts of the vaccinations that their children were giving and they were like oh my god leukemia is there as one of the side effects they they did this to me and so now they're like you know they're re they're ready to go to war so i think i think things are not exactly the same as they always have been. And I think that the percentage of people who are uh, open and ready to wake up is, is, is significantly greater now than it was maybe even just a few years ago. You know, think, Alex, oh, oh, sorry. sorry, I just wanted to say um, what you were saying earlier. When I published the episode with Charlie, I called it Conspiracies Are Real and Affect You because I'm, I'm trying to reach kind of Main Street people. <clears throat> So I, I shared the episode with a bunch of people that I know. One of my friends comes back and he says, that's exactly what they want you to believe, brah. So, um, they, you know, this, this phantom created by the mainstream media, uh, you know, it's, they probably don't have as much power as we think they do. Um, but I don't know if, if any of you guys have heard of a guy called Rupert Sheldrake. He's a biologist from the, the UK and he talks, he came up with this concept of a morphogenetic field. So he doesn't believe that heredity is only transferred through our genes, but there are invisible fields, you know, like a magnetic field or whatever that give form. And this is why he says like rats in a, in a lab that learn how to navigate a maze in Australia, the next set of rats in, in the US we will learn how to navigate that maze faster. And the next set of rats, let's say in Europe, will even faster, even more quickly learn how to navigate that maze. So it's the same like if you enter into a psychedelic state, you literally are able to allow other people to, it's like standing on the shoulders of giants. So <clears throat> the more people, like you say, these kind of late to awaken people that feel betrayed, the more people that awake, 
the more this kind of morphogenetic field sweeps humanity and it's not it's not bound by time and space it's kind of like uh you know what i mean it's like it's 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 in a plane that is outside of the you know the 3 4d reality so the the more we do the work as as horrible it is sometimes and you feel like you're not reaching out to anyone or not enough people and you look at the mainstream narrative and you see how how bad shit's going to get everybody's going to get vaccinated and they're lining up for it and and the next thing they're going to get micro microchipped but the more we awaken even one two people per day or whatever the more that morphogenetic field becomes stronger where one day people like if we if we have this momentum one day people will just be like no that sounds like bullshit you know like you that's it. Yeah. Let's yeah, wrap it with uh, let's have Vanessa go really quick because she's uh, yeah. running out of electricity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've only got about forty five minutes left, and I need to kind of go and quickly charge things. No, I I think the one important point that I kind of want to make is, you know, um, the U.S. U.K. led alliance of terrorism. Um, has effectively waged hybrid multi-spectrum wars against prey nations for since the war on terror was was launched right now the war on terror is against us uh, we are the new target of the war on terror one and the hybrid war the multi-spectrum wars are now being waged against us against our populations so I think now more than ever, it's important to start making those connections between what has been happening in Syria and Libya and Iraq and Venezuela and Yemen, uh, you know, globally and, and us, you know, we're being put into situations now of, of food insecurity, of economic insecurity. We're under sanctions. <laughs> we're under lockdown. We're under blockade. We're effectively receiving the same treatment that's been handed out by our governments to these nations. And many of us have kind of gone, yeah, well, that's over there. <laughs> you know, that's in another country. It's kind of sad. But now we're feeling it. So now I think the, the positive that comes out of this is that we're all together in this. There's no more left-right paradigm, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. This is about humanity. This is about saving us, saving what we believe in. It's what Syria has been fighting for for 10 years and saving its secular society, its independence, its integrity, its territorial integrity. But that's what we're now fighting for. So actually, as humanity now, we're being brought together more than ever before if we can just recognize it. And I think that's one message that we should all be putting out, not talking about platforms that are left or right, the platforms that are supporting free speech and humanity, that are supporting the little people, the working class, those that can't fight for themselves, that's what's now important. And I think that's one of the positives that's going to come out of this. I really do. And I think, I don't know, but I just feel really strongly that as independent speakers and people with platforms and following, this is what we should be starting to, to make people understand and, and appreciate you know it doesn't matter if we disagree politically it doesn't matter if we like trump we like biden whatever but just to recognize it's not about any of this it's about us and it's about the future we give to our kids our grandkids our you know but it's about the future our future and we're all in it together actually you know hating each other another time <laughs> Let's yeah. focus, let's prioritize, let's focus on the people above us that are causing all of this problem. Yeah. And then if after we're t we take care of them, if we want to fight amongst ourselves, go for it. But, but I get the feeling that at that point, there won't be much of a need for a fight or it won't look no. as dire. Because, because people, you know, they work on division. Yeah. They work on creating all these organizations that, that end up making us fight. Brexit was a division point. You know, all of all of these issues, COVID is a division point, right? Everything is. Syria was a division point. They're all about dividing us. And that's what they do in these countries. They divide them along sectarian lines to maintain the conflict. But we need to actually be above that conflict point. Because as you say, when we go back to, to or, or we go forward, 
to the world that we want to live in, all of those issues become irrelevant, right? <laughs> I said the same about the, the Q guys. I was speaking to some of the guys that have been feel let down by Q, and I said to them, well, what was it you wanted to achieve? Like, what did you want the outcome to be? So take Trump out. Do you still want them outcomes? And went, well, yeah. So well, they're the outcomes I want as well. So what's the difference? And I think that's what we, there's a big group there that really just wanted the same outcomes that most of us wanted. They just put their money on the wrong horse. And I just think if they can kind of come, come and join, I mean, that's a massive movement there of people that actually wanted decent, good outcomes. They just were, took a log on a ride by the wrong person, but it's already ready made. You've just kind of got, got to go, we still want the same bloody thing. So what Vanessa was saying there, I think is completely right. We just, we actually all just want the same thing. We might have different ways of thinking about it, but actually I just, I want what you want. You don't want your kids to grow up in a world where someone like Biden gets into presidency and he can sniff kids and get away with it. And you don't want a world where you can't say what you want to people for fear of being put in prison. So we all really do want the same thing regardless. And that's, I think the most powerful thing is there, what do you want? What, what sure. do you want the world to like? goes even farther. I think it's not just Q people, but the BLM people and the Me Too people and the women watching, walking, uh, marching for reproductive rights. Take care, Vanessa. But, you know, they all want the same thing, which is to keep government off out of your body, your rights to freedom of speech, and your right to make a living and take care of your family. They all have that. They they literally are all marching. Like when, when BLM marches about law enforcement not shooting unarmed black people that's the same thing as like i have the right to fucking freedom and i have the right not to be taken out by a government uh and overreaching law enforcement i mean it's all the same thing but what happens is the news kind of gear like pushes people in certain directions that end up fighting people on your level or below it's never fighting up it's all the same march man it's really all the same march, but they just get you to believe that the people you want, who you're fighting against, like you know all the uh, all the all the people mad at Antifa or all the people mad at BLM, like so fuck these guys, they're just like they're just rider lunatics. Well, they think the same thing of you, but in the end of the day, it's like stop shooting unarmed people, let people open their job businesses and make money. Don't tell me why I can do it with my body, whether it's abortion rights or taking a vaccine. You all have the same arguments, but you're just, you got your guns drawn on the same guy instead of fucking looking up and going, dude, they're the problem. We're not the problem. We all have, we all have the basic, the, we basically have the same problem. We just have a little specific differences and that's it. But nobody ever wants to look at that because it's so much easier to tee off on your own level and below. Yeah. But I think I, th I think Sam, it's not it's not just that. Yeah, we all have our difference. You know, maybe I'm against vaccines, maybe you're pro vaccines, maybe I'm anti gay, maybe you're pro gay, whatever. But again, we go back to the one group having the ability to issue money because then you know, like when they have the ability to issue money, then they tell you, hey, you wanna you wanna raise hell? Here's some money, uh, organize people, because without money, you're not even going to have a coffee maker, a computer, and an office space. And if you ask people, hey, why don't you all pitch in 100 bucks a month so we can have these things and T-shirts and, and placards, nobody will give you 100 bucks a month. It has to come from George Soros. So it's George Soros who will give money to BLM, and then they're going to give money to um, Antifa's. And then they're going to tell them, OK, you know, like when Trump says this, go out and and like break everything. And so that's how it happens. I think that even where we have differences of opinion on this on that, or that, we wouldn't really go beat the crap out of each other over it. Maybe we'd have a maybe we'd have a discussion of it in a pub. And maybe if somebody got overheated, maybe we'd even fall to fist. But that's it, you know, on a one to one basis. It wouldn't be like this group of 10,000 people coming out with baseball bats, uh, trashing everything. Yeah, there's, there's, we have, we have a, a, a fundamental flaw as human beings in that, that we're tribal beings. And, and these people in control know this. And it's been used for thousands of years. You know, that when the Theodosian walls were, were, were wrecked and Attila the Hun was marching on Const Constantinople, they pitched the, you know, the fans of the, 
green <laughs> green chariot racing team against the fans of the blue chariot racing team who could build rebuild the Theodosian walls faster. And they're always preying on on this tribal nature that we have as human beings. And until we can sort of escape that and try and get to a, you know, without trying to sound like a hippy dippy, try and get to the next level of consciousness, they're always going to try and divide us and use our own innate psychology against us. I concur, man. I shouldn't include Antifa there. And there are controlled uh, opposition and agents of chaos, uh, provocateurs, excuse me, that are sent in to get us to do that. So I would agree with that. But, you know, BLM 2 is kind of like Black Lives Matter 2, which is the original and uh, everybody else. But, yeah, I agree with that. They, they get us to fight with each other, controlling money and paying chaos. And these people don't realize what they're doing. And, you know, if you go back also to how much of this Antifa, we're like just rich kids who got to basically, if you look in Seattle, Chicago, they were just playing the purge. They literally had a day of the purge where they're like, hey, man, no laws. Go burn down stuff. Go punch people. And if you go to jail, we're going to release you. But those, are, in my opinion, are, you know, agents, uh, provocateurs. But I think people... I mean, when they sit down, they're like, hey, we don't want a law enforcement that uses unjustified violence. And we don't want the government telling us what to do. And we want to be able to run our business and all that stuff. I think, yeah, I think what everybody's saying here is right. It's like they just pit us against each other. But I will say in the United States, we are now seeing like black conservatives starting to rise up and hotops, they're called. And they're pushing back on this narrative that black people are the most oppressed people in the world and they and the, and it's like i think it's starting to resonate and it's like these these discussions which like the union of the unwanted is having is like i love li i could just sit here and just listen all day i know i talk a lot but you know i could just listen to you guys because it's so powerful and i think the word is getting out yeah i think the, the term principles over personalities is a really a thing that i kind of try and repeat in my head because it's like it did <sighs> It is a kind of ego. We all have our own. We have egos. Of course we do. We always. But what we're trying to aim for and the principles, I think people kind of we write down what you actually want out of life. What are your principles? And then get out of the way if it's not right. If what you're, you're thinking isn't right. Well, I constantly get things wrong. Of course I do. But I actually I think maybe having children is, is, a, is a big different game changer for some people because it's not really about what you want anymore because, you know, you're only here for a long. I mean, I'm near 40, probably got another 65 minutes and I'm off but it, it like it does change the game for you because it's not about you anymore and I think anyone who has children kind of realizes that look it's literally if this is shit now what's it going to be like in 10 years time and that's what really frightens me and I kind of yeah, maybe that, that makes you step out of yourself I don't know what you guys think yeah if you I mean having children definitely changes the perspective completely but you you have to and part of being a good parent is laying down the foundation for a better life for the next generation. And if if we can't do that here through through discussion and and that uh, kind of drive to to change things for the better for the future generations, then then what are we doing? Exactly. So you, what you'd want for your children, you'd hopefully want for other people's children as well. But, yeah, absolutely, the next generation, yeah, as a whole. Absolutely. And we're the generation that need to do that because the generation now that are going through universities that are coming out with the whole Antifa mentality, the whole censorship mentality, the digital book burning, you know, shutting down speakers at their campuses they don't like. We've got to make sure that doesn't get pushed onto our kids because, hmm. you know, one day they'll be that they'll be the, the majority, you know, because the kids today that are going through that, they're the adults of tomorrow. They're going to go into those corporations into politics into those positions that are going to then have that influence and uh we've got to make sure that we don't let them and i mm. think what um you guys were saying there about antifa what i think it was sam was saying about antifa and these rich kids going in and just kicking off and i think again it ties into what richard was saying as well about principles i think the majority of people don't have any now they don't have any principles and that's one of the big things that i'd want to teach my son who's only eight months but, but to have boundaries in life you have certain things that you won't accept. You have a line that you won't allow to be crossed in terms of a level of self-respect that you have for yourself, whether it be in a relationship, a friendship or something the government are asking you to do that you don't consider right or fair. That line where actually you just turn around and say, no, I don't accept that. 
I don't care if you're supposedly in a position of authority. I'm not doing what you've told me to do. And I think that's where kids today don't have that. And I think all those organisations that you guys have been talking about, BLM, Antifa, um, Me Too, all those, they've been really gearing to try and make people feel like they're victims. And if you feel like you're a victim, you've got no power, nothing I can do can actually make any make anything happen, have any influence, then you've generally got no boundaries. And I think that's a massive issue. I mean, I put something out on social media the other day and I've actually been banned from Facebook. I don't know why. Um, but uh, I just said, if you believe what's going on at the moment, you believe in COVID, you're, you're scared, you're whatever. What is your line, though? What would um, Biden or Boris Johnson have to come on the news and say, this is what we need you to do now, where you would actually go, no, actually, that's that's too far. I'm not prepared to do that. You know, if, if they say you need to you need to crawl, crawl down the street now because COVID hovers at two feet three feet would you do that or would you say no that's ridiculous i'm not doing that where is the line because it feels like some people or the majority of people just don't have one just don't have one and it's um it's quite scary to see but i think that's what it's a very good place to start start with yourself someone mentioned it earlier that you need to work on yourself before you can go and start kind of trying to reorganize the world jordan peterson talks a lot about that but i think that's where we probably need to start getting people to look in the mirror firstly and take some responsibility do you not think the line changes, Jamie? And that um, I would never have thought two or three years ago that I would just accept being kind of locked in my own house. I can go out for exercise once a day. No way. That would never happen. There's my line. But now I've accepted it to because I have to. And I don't know where – you're right. I don't know where the next line is. And I don't know if it is, you know, crawling along the streets or – I have to isolate in a single room or, you know, it's, it's crazy. But have you really truly accepted this, uh, this whole lockdown? That's, that's yes. the big question. Yes, officer, I have. <laughs> well, you're going to be receiving a, 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 a hundred pound fine if, I, if you're out <laughs> outside of certain hours, young sir. I mean, as we're highlighting the, the, the line, the morals, the principles that were, we were the age of most of us on this um, this talk at the moment, we uh, I would I would appreciate and think that most of us were brought up with a certain set of morals, principles, um, knowing good from 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 bad, evil, etc. The further and further we've got through time with the manipulation of big tech and, and the governmental system, they've totally eroded and broken down the ability for parents to just be able to parent. The time scales that we've got, people are working not 37.5 hours a week, they're working 40 plus hours a week, not including traveling an hour to work and an hour back to work from work. And then you've got your children who go to preschool or what is it, breakfast club, they'll go to breakfast club first, then they'll go to school, then they'll go to after school. And then they'll get picked up by their parents or they'll even go to a babysitter after and the parents will pick them up. They'll go and have McNasties and then they'll run upstairs and they're, they're in their phone, they're in their phone, they're in their tablets. There's no communication. There's, there's no unpacking of the day. You know, we, we, they've, the, the system has created robots, not sheep, robots, synthetic um, robots with a, with a mentality of if the government, if this little shiny box, which is in my little, my little box room, which is in my little box house, if it says this, that is what I need to do. So the, the, the line is, Mr. Boris Johnson will come on at eight o'clock and he'll say to everybody, the new rules before entering the shop is you've got to hop on one foot first, 360 degrees, and then you've got to do the Macarena and then you can come in. That will make you safe public. Yeah, this is what a cult does. It breaks down your boundaries and it pushes them slowly, slowly back to their road. And this is what's yeah. happened is it's a cult. And, and and I genuinely believe that this is a cult. They've it's um it, it, it it's like Biderman's chart of coercion that me and Jay have talked about, me and Gaz have talked about. If you look through that chart, that shows you how it's this has been done. Biderman's chart of coercion, they've literally ticked their way down this list. This is and that's that's a system they use to torture prisoners of war. This is exactly what they've done. This is a cult, and they've gradually ebbed away, as you say, as Jay was saying, 
personal boundaries that I think we may be the last generation. We're around about the same age. You know, Jay's about 10 years old, younger than me, but the same kind of catchment. Don't say older. Fuck right off. Yeah. <laughs> it's good lighting. Um, I, I, I think... Off. I'm sorry about this. I hate to cut you off, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Apologies. I love you. I have to jump off. Great conversation. I loved everybody here. What a wonderful conversation to honor to chop it up with you guys. And, you know, I appreciate it. Great job, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. See you later, chat. Sorry, just, yeah, just to finish that, it is, it's a cult and they've gradually eroded away your self, self-esteem, your boundaries that you accept. And that's what this is about. It's a slow ebbing away of your self-respect and your boundaries and what you will say yes and no to and what you'll push back on. And that happens over time in an abusive relationship when you're knackered. And we're knackered, but it well, can't go on forever. There is a point where you go, I'm in the corner and there is no further back now. And I've got to come back forward. And that's where we're going to get to very soon, hopefully, is that where people go, now I'm in the corner and now we come forward. And that's where they, they're terrified of, I believe. Well, we know that in the United States, we've been experiencing this insanity. And we just wanted to make sure that you guys were experiencing it too. That's why we did the show. We just wanted to check. Oh yeah, sure- don't worry. We're not missing out. Okay, good. Yeah, I figured. I mean, you guys have your own flavor of insanity, which, you know, you have guys like Hat Mancock and, and, you know, people like that that are dishing out this obvious government fuckery. So it's just a different version of it. But I I feel like it's it's good to at least have uh, these conversations where we uh, get everyone together, get us starting to think about something maybe on a global level. Um, that's why we do these shows. We've been doing them twice a month for the last couple of months. They've really been catching on. It was very important for us to have a UK representation of this. Other so Alex, you've been on the show before, even though you were, it was like three o'clock in the morning for you. No, uh, it's at nine. It's 9 p.m. Yeah, right. But when you came on before, you stayed yeah, up yeah. late. <laughs> we were very grateful, but it also it also signaled a flaw in our, our show's schedule, and that is that it's not as conducive for our UK audience. That's the reason why we wanted to do a, spe- a specific show uh, for you guys, because, you know, listen, we're all obviously we're all in this together uh, in, in a real way, not like the way the politicians tell us that we are. But we we actually are. And, and, it, and, it, and it doesn't matter which country we're in. We're experiencing some of the same things. I think this will give a lot of people, you know, I think a lot of people will recognize that uh, they're not alone, which is important in this time. Uh, we don't want to be in this situation, lockdowns and all this insanity. But if there's anything worse than that, it's thinking that you're there by yourself. So at least this is a little bit of comfort for other people recognizing that uh, um, this is a shared experience for a lot of us. Uh, and then thinking about ways that we can move past this because these things don't last forever. This insanity doesn't stay. You know, there comes a break, a tipping point where people rise up. It's just about trying to figure out where that is. And like, like uh, our, our, you know, like Ben said that there, you know, there's a, we've had our own internal lines in the sand. In some cases, we've crossed them. Uh, so tr- trying to determine where we where we put the next line and 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 do we collectively stand up? So I, I'm really grateful that everyone was able to come out and join us. Uh, let's wrap up with people uh, t- just explaining, just saying where uh, the audience can find them. Uh, let's drive some traffic to your shows. Let's start with uh with the let's start with the Amish since they don't <laughs> have. I just Bill, I'll, uh, sorry, Ben. Sorry, did I cut you off? I'm, I usually do that, don't I? <laughs> uh, I just want to say thanks again. I think this has been brilliant tonight. I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's been good to meet everyone and connect with people. And um, keep your chin up, people. People are really struggling in this country. Yeah. Grandparents are scared of their grandchildren. This is where we're at. Yeah. And this is... We're in a dark place and, you know, people are struggling mentally. Keep your chin up. Like Charlie said, we're going to get through it. Most important thing, go to the armistice inquisition.com. <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. Oh, it's, Christian, it's where great. can we find you? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all over the usual channels, um, Spotify and, and the other stuff. So, uh yeah, get on board. Thank you very much again. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. Great to meet you guys. Absolutely fantastic to um, to be involved in this conversation. And yeah, um, peace out. Thank you. Thanks. Christian, where can people find your work? Yeah, so uh, 
christianjordanov.com is my website. Uh, if you search for my name, it's hard to spell, but my pod- podcast is Connecting Minds, and that's on YouTube for now and all the, all the usual places. So Connecting Minds with Christian Jordanov or christianjordanov.com. Uh, maybe there'll be a link in the description because there's no point in me spelling out my name, but thank you so much, Charlie. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me on. It was a real pleasure and honor to, you know, converse with you guys. Definitely learned a lot and, um, yeah, she'll be checking out your, your stuff in the coming days. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Jamie, uh, Jamie over at iconic where, uh, what do you guys have cooking in the future? I know a lot, but. Uh, yeah, quite a lot. Um, we're launching a new show in a couple of weeks uh, with Gareth, who was on for a minute, um, presenting. Um, like a kind of, obviously our, our whole concept has been to to bring like the mainstream production standard, if you like, to, to the alternative information, alternative content. Just to kind of, I think someone mentioned it earlier on here, I think it was Sam was mentioning it, that, you know, people talk to each other and then, they say things they don't quite grasp it yet. Then someone on the BBC or CNN says it. And then people, Oh, have you heard this when it's the same thing? And I think a lot of that is the perception of, of the information comes down to the production a little bit. Somebody sat in a suit in a posh studio for somebody that is new to this information on the surface that they look like they have more credibility than for example, any of us sat talking in our rooms, the information they're talking is rubbish. They're talking off an autocue, whereas we're talking from what we actually have researched ourselves. But to the kind of viewer at home that's new to this, they, they see that. So that's always been our concept. So we're going to launch yeah, a new show. Um, it's going to go out every Friday um, from probably first week of March, um, uh, presented by Gareth. Yeah, that's going to be kind of a hybrid between a mainstream, sound bitey, very quick paced, and a kind of really long, in depth interview kind of concept try and mash up the two and see what uh see what happens really because no one's doing that um in the uk i don't think yet kind of like an alex jones style um studio broadcast kind of thing and yeah we'll see how that goes and rich rich is working on some really cool films at the moment as well aren't you mate on the channel unmute myself um yeah yeah i'm working on a film called war of the words so that's obviously about our uh, social media censorship and just uh, uh, um this whole Thing about um being uh, domestic terrorists and where this is heading and this is with a lot of the guys charlie's already sent his video in and quite a few other guys like sam tripoli has agreed to do it some uh ryan christian of the, the last vagrant from vagabond um james corbett quite a few people that are out there doing some really great stuff have agreed to be in the film as well so this is about about that about war of the words and it's actually set in like a 1950s sci-fi film so it will be really different to look at so this is the sort of work we get to do at iconic which obviously jamie started and i'm really grateful to be part of it as well so you can find my work and the films that i've made before um all on iconic.com or you can find my my podcast is on there as well the video versions i'm on youtube still just about and a bit shoot at the moment and that's where you can find my work and glitch in the code.co.uk if you want to send me an email um but yeah most of my stuff's on iconic and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be part of that because it's something that needs to be done we need an industry behind what we do so we can all make a living doing this because we deserve to quite frankly if you're going to earn 250 grand a year for talking shit on the bbc we should be at least be able to um, earn a living making content that's actually really helping people and it's something i'm very passionate about i agree i agree i'm very speech that one i'm partial to iconic you can find my show on iconic as well so obviously i'm a i'm a fan noble where can where can we get where can people find your work where can people check you out Yes, firstly, I've uh, very much enjoyed the, uh, the conversation uh, uh, today slash tonight. Um, you can catch me on most major platforms on the CFR network. Um, also on the old boob tube, aka YouTube, on the CFR network again. Uh, censorship is real, as we've been highlighting. It's uh, very interesting times that we're living in. Uh, very much so. Interesting, wonderful times. Um, be the best person you can be. If you're the, if you're very new and just stumbled across this um, this particular link, be the best person you can be. Question absolutely everything. Study to show thyself approved, and most importantly, 
pass on the information, each one teach 12. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks. And let's wrap up with Alex. Alex, where can we find you? Uh, guys, first, thanks for having me. The only way this could be better for me is if we could share a pint together. That would be fantastic. And I hope that I hope that life will give us this, uh, this possibility. Yeah. Uh, I publish uh, on, uh, on a blog called The Naked Hedgy. And uh, Richard, if you're doing a show about censorship, I had my book was the book I published in 2017 was banned by Amazon twice, not once, twice. <laughs> so, and part of the hypo, nobody sued me. They said, they said I defamed somebody, but nobody sued me. It was on the intervention of Jonathan Weiner, who was the policy advisor to uh, John Kerry in Obama administration in the State Department. Anyway, so I have I have expert excerpts from that book on my uh, blog, The Naked Hedgy. And uh, I unfortunately don't write quite as often as I'd like to because uh, I'm busy with work. I'm busy with uh, trying to raise two boys and being uh, actually a present father. But um, uh, hopefully I'll be able to do more writing in the near future. And so uh, in that near future, maybe we can share a pint one of these days. That would be great. So thank you for having me. And it was great. I enjoyed this greatly. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. We know you have busy schedules and lots of things that you're doing. So uh, for Ricky Brandis from Ripple Effect, who had to take off and Sam Tripoli from Tinfoil Hat, Midnight Mike running the show from OBDM. I'm Charlie at uh, Macro Aggressions. Thank you all for coming out. Share this video far and wide. The sensors will not help us and we appreciate it. Thanks everybody. Thanks guys.